cognitive science studies our mind. Wouldn't it be great to learn how our mind works and use this information to help us reach fluency in English faster? Well, I've read a book that does exactly that, and I can't wait to talk about it. Hey, my fellow English learner, you're watching Fluent English with Lady Giraffe. I'm Olga, and today I'm gonna share 10 lessons I've learned from the book Becoming Fluent – How Cognitive Science Can Help Adults Learn a Foreign Language by Richard M. Roberts. At the end, I'm gonna share some excellent practical tips to help you learn English in the best way possible. We're gonna start with this one. You probably heard this idea that it's easy for a child to learn English or any other language for that matter. And the children are so much better at learning languages. You're not a child anymore, I'm pretty sure. So if this idea that adults are worse at learning is true, it's a bit depressing, don't you think? You don't need to worry. Basically, children are definitely better at three things. The native accent, openness to learning, and memorization. Yes, it's true that children have a much better chance of sounding like native speakers than adults do. It's not impossible to acquire a native sounding accent when you're an adult. But it takes an enormous amount of time and effort. For most learners, it's not worth it. I stopped fighting against my accent. Instead, I focused on analyzing the areas that make it difficult for others to understand me and worked on them. A native accent is not the be-all and end-all of language learning. Children also don't tend to overthink the process of learning a language and don't have as much learning anxiety as adults do. This is definitely something I wish I had. After many, many years of practice, I'm fine with talking to people in English, but if somebody asks me something in my third language, I freeze and act like a deer caught in headlights. Kids also rely a lot on rote memorization. Most adults can do that because as we're aging, our memory unfortunately gets worse. Instead, we can rely on our cognitive strengths and be aware of our weaknesses. And we're gonna talk about it later in the video. So our lesson number one is you're perfectly capable of learning a foreign language. Stop using the excuse that adults are just bad at languages and there is nothing you can do. That's not true. But do keep in mind a few things about how our brain can sabotage our learning. For example, we tend to be way too optimistic about things we want to accomplish. In two years, I'm gonna speak fluent English. That's not how it works. We tend to way underestimate how much time, work, and money we'll need to reach this goal. This is called the planning fallacy, and it can seriously screw us up. Another thing you need to look out for is called the confirmation bias. You have certain beliefs in how to learn languages. When you're reading or listening to other people's experiences and opinions, you're gonna trust the information you agree with more much more, and you're gonna ignore the information that goes against your beliefs. Just keep this in mind and don't be quick at dismissing potentially useful tips just because they're not what you expected. Our lesson number two is learn about common fallacies and biases and plan your studies accordingly. If you're really confident in your reading skills, check out another book, Thinking Fast 
and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. You learn more about various cognitive biases in this book. It's Excellent. Now, we can be bad at planning our studies, but we can also be bad at sticking to our plans. Let's talk about habits. You've probably heard that you need 21 days to form a habit. Actually, it's a myth. There is no exact deadline, and the amount of time you need depends on many, many factors. Becoming fluent tells us that to learn a language, we need to incorporate it in our daily lives as much as possible. But not every activity you can do is a good one. For example, to learn vocabulary for everyday objects, some suggest to put sticky notes on everything in your house. This is a very superficial way to learn new words, according to the book and not very effective. A better way would be to try to remember the name of the object in English when you look at it. And if you can't, look it up in the dictionary. Also, think about the word and how it's connected to everything you already know. When you can easily recall the word, start making up sentences with it. Another thing about study habits is that it's better to learn a little bit, <laughs> but often, than spend hours studying English on the weekends. The book calls it the fertilizer fallacy. Like when people think that if a little bit of a fertilizer helps a plant grow, using a lot of it must be better. No, it's a sure way to burn the roots. The same with learning. Our lesson number three is develop the habit of studying regularly, even for just a little bit. If you're bored with grammar, read a book. Bored with the book? Watch a video in English. Do something. The next idea from this book I found interesting was that as adults, we become kind of experts at learning through a mix of reading and listening. That's why it's a good idea to learn English in this way, at least for a while. You can use subtitles when you're watching something, read and listen to books at the same time, listen to podcasts and read the transcripts at the same time. You get the idea. The book also recommends learning to both read and speak at the same time. Like, you shouldn't wait for years to start speaking. In this way, you can reinforce your speaking and listening through reading and vice versa. This is our fourth lesson. Don't ignore the learning methods that are determined to be effective. Like, in this case, the combination of reading and listening. Speaking of speaking, it's important to speak with a lot of different people in different contexts. Also, it's a good idea to ask your conversational partner, if you have one, to correct your mistakes and give you suggestions. However, even though I understand this is great advice, honestly, I'm not that great at following it. I'm an introvert, and usually I have to force myself to find opportunities to practice speaking my target languages. I need to do better. Don't be like me. Use every opportunity to talk to people in English. Take into account that when you're practicing speaking, figurative language is as important as literal. You need to spend time memorizing idiomatic expressions because they're everywhere. Like, take into account that I used a couple of sentences earlier. I'm not literally asking you to use your bank accounts, of course. The meaning is figurative. I asked you to pay attention. English is filled with examples like that. Another thing, when we're speaking, we naturally tend to pause pretty often, usually to think of a word or idea. 
but when we're speaking in a foreign language, these pauses can be much longer and slightly uncomfortable. Your speaking partner may even try to fill in these pauses or misinterpret them as you having nothing more to say. To avoid that, the book suggests learning a few phrases that show that you need a little bit of time to think, like, um, let me see, just a moment, or I'll let me think about it. Like, by learning to use them, you're likely to avoid awkward long pauses in the future. So this is the lesson number five. Speak in English a lot and learn to use idiomatic language. This will make you become a lot more fluent in the language. But what happens when you're finally reaching fluency? When learners get to the point when they can do most things in the language, a lot of them stop studying and don't bother improving anymore. You might even feel that you've mastered the language. The book calls this process fossilization, and it's generally not considered to be a good thing. That's why the lesson number six is never stop learning. Learning a language is a lifelong commitment. Of course, with time, studying can look completely different, and even simple activities like consuming content in English will help you continue improving in the language. When I was reading Becoming Fluent, I came across the concept of pragmatics, which was kind of new to me. It's basically the context in which the language is used. In other words, it's about the social aspect of language use. Is your partner speaking sincerely or are they using sarcasm, for example? Are they playful or simply rude? Stuff like this is impossible to understand by just learning vocabulary and grammar from a textbook. You need to study the culture of the countries where English is spoken. If you're not paying attention to pragmatics, you're missing out so much, not only in interactions with other people, but also in understanding what's happening in TV shows and movies. I believe that TV shows and movies are excellent resources for learning these kinds of things. Don't ignore the culture and social aspects of the language. This is our lesson number seven. You don't want to find yourself in very uncomfortable situations. Now, let's talk about some practical things you can incorporate into your learning routine right now. Memory plays a huge part in our studies. When I was at school, my memory for new information was impeccable. I remember that once I pretty much memorized a whole history textbook in one evening, except the dates. I'm much older now, and I feel that memorizing something takes so much more effort from me. You probably know that there are two major types of memory, short-term and long-term. When you're trying to memorize a bunch of new words and keep repeating them to yourself, you're using your short-term or working memory. Your goal is to move these words from this temporary place into your long-term memory so that you can actually like use them. It's not a straightforward process, unfortunately. You probably know this already. Learning long lists of new words by heart doesn't mean that any of these words stay in your memory for more than a few hours. Been there, done that. Instead, the book recommends that you focus on meaning and also learn to chunk your lists of words into meaningful units. What do I mean by chunking? Imagine you need to remember a long number. How many digits can you keep in your working memory? Less than 20. Most people on average are fine with about seven, 
plus minus 2. Let's say the number is 1990200000210220. Most people will remember 1990200 out of all these digits, like seven numbers. However, if you look closer, you'll find a pattern dates. 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020. Now most people will easily recall all 16 digits because they used chunking to put meaning into the numbers. So we can use this knowledge to learn vocabulary more effectively. Look at your list of words and learn chunking them into units that mean something. There is a wonderful exercise I love where you take random words and put them together into a story. And I have a video about it. Besides chunking, it's also a very good idea to paraphrase things you want to learn. It's the strategy I use often, and I swear by it. This is our lesson number eight. Use chunking and paraphrasing to help you learn things better. There is a certain limit to the amount of resources our working memory can use at any given moment. This is called the cognitive load. Sometimes you study and feel like your head is about to explode. This is called the cognitive overload. In this state, you can't use your working memory and basically you can't study properly. There are a few things you can do to avoid this. Minimize distractions. Silence your phone. Put on headphones if you're in a noisy environment. And try not to multitask. Like, don't watch TV while doing grammar exercises. Break one big task into smaller tasks. Take into consideration external factors that can influence your cognitive load, like motivation, your state of health, or even the feeling of hunger. <laughs> when you study and you feel like it's too much, switch to an easier task or take a break. When my brain is drained, I like watching simple and comfortable TV shows and videos in the languages I'm learning. I'm still studying, but with less stress to myself. Pay attention to your cognitive load. This is our lesson number nine. Ignoring this can lead straight to burnout. And it's not a fun state to be in. I hope that you understand it and choose your learning tasks accordingly. Some tasks are more effective than others. Do you want to improve your active vocabulary, recalling words with ease when you need them? Do you want to use different grammar structures easily? Well, in this case, you need to understand the difference between shallow and deep processing. These are two ways of taking in knowledge. To put it simply, when you're trying to look at a list of words and repeat them out loud, the memory doesn't stick for long. This type of processing is shallow. When you're thinking about the meaning behind words, using paraphrasing, thinking about how the words relate to you and everything you already know, you're processing the information more deeply. In this way, you have a much better chance of remembering the words for a long, long time. Remember sticky notes? A shallow task. Reading out loud is a shallow task. It doesn't mean that it's bad, just that it's not effective for improving your vocabulary and grammar use, for example. Simply repeating phrases and sentences is also a shallow task. It's better to paraphrase. Writing a word over and over is also a shallow task. It's better to think more deeply about this word and break it down into its meaningful components, as the book calls it. Like, what is the root of this word? Are there any suffixes or prefixes, etc.? Do you know what else leads to you learning something and recalling it easily when you need it? 
two things. First, this information must be overlearned. And second, distributed practice. Overlearning is simply reviewing the same things multiple times. And distributed practice means that it's a bad idea to cram all your studies into eight hours and weekends. Spread it out. Like, remember we talked about developing the habit of studying regularly. That's it. Our lesson number 10 is develop the habit of thinking more deeply about vocabulary and grammar in English. Which of the lessons do you think of implementing into your studies? I'd love to hear from you in the comments. If you want to learn my favorite free resources and tools to help you improve English even faster, check out this video next. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time with more awesome language content.